And so I've kept it very loose. So I'm anxious to find out what it could become. It more than 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 than, than what I would like for it to be. We see reality according to our thought. Wherever you look, it's the product of thought. <laughs> uh, buildings are, you know, uh, farms, airplanes, everything, pollution. <laughs> and therefore, thought is constantly participating, both in sh sh giving shape and form and figuration to ourselves and to the whole of reality, right? I think reality. Of course, it is whole different, interdependent. See, without, you see, in order to exist something, one thing, one particular thing, see, without other factor, it cannot exist. So you see, everything related. The faster, the quicker, the develop, the the people in the developed countries are are taught to uh, to understand that it is really in their interest to reduce poverty in the world, the faster our planet will be able to solve that issue. For the Tibetans, the Dalai Lama is Chen Rezig, the Buddha of compassion. You need a sense of universal responsibility based on love and compassion has been the Dalai Lama's message ever since he fled from Tibet in 1959. Tibetan spirit, very strong. Much better. Quantum physicist and philosopher David Bohm was profoundly affected by his close contacts with both Einstein and J. Krishnamurti. Bohm's theory of wholeness and the implicate order states that there is something like life and mind unfolded in everything. You can't, on, 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 on one little ball, like the Earth, isolate yourself. For influential artist Robert Rauschenberg, art is not half as interesting as life. Rauschenberg promotes international understanding and peace by exhibiting his own artworks in some of the most troubled places of the world. When not traveling, he spends his time working on the island of Captiva in Florida. I recognize the fact that, that if we don't, uh, we the living people right now, don't uh, pay attention to the total world. And so what we have to do is, is somehow uh, establish a society, a successful society, uh, that would uh, somehow educate everyone in all parts of the land so that uh, that they would realize that, 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 that we're just on this little ball here and everything that we do because we have been very extravagant in our developments that everything that we do makes a difference here and there and everywhere. Well. You see, I think the difficulty is this fragmentation, first of all. Everybody is, uh, all thought is broken up into bits, like this nation, this country, this industry, this profession, and so on, and they can't meet, right? And uh, it's extremely hard to break into that. Now, uh, the, the second, but that comes about primarily because thought has developed traditionally in a way such that it claims not to be affecting anything, but just telling you the way things are. Therefore, people cannot see that they are creating a problem and then apparently trying to solve it. That is, see, let's take the problem, what problem do you like? Pollution, the, the, or the ecology. See, the ecology is not in itself a problem. It works perfectly well by itself. It's due to us, right? It's a problem because we are thinking in, in a certain way by breaking everything up and each person's doing his own thing, right? Now, 
Therefore, the ecological problem is due to thought, right? But thought thinks it is a problem out there, and I must solve it. Now, that doesn't make sense, because simultaneously thought is doing all the activities which make the problem, and then does another set of activities to try to overcome it. <laughs> you see, it doesn't stop doing the things which are making the ecological problem, right? or the national problem, or whatever the problem is. Uh, Buddhists believe the one self as a creator. So, the future, the good or bad, entirely depend on present or, how to say, shoulder. It, it entirely, how to say, depend on our own the present, how to say, behavior, or present action. The earth is one household, really. Yeah. <laughs> We're not treating it that way, right? So that's the first step in economics, is to say the earth is one household and all that it depends on, it's all one, you see. So. Uh, now, the implicate order would help us to see that, to see everything unfolds everything. <laughs> that everybody not merely depends on everybody, but actually everybody is everybody in a deeper sense. See, we are the earth because all our substance comes from the earth and goes back. I mean, it's, it's wrong to say it's an environment, you see, it's just yeah. surrounding us, because that would be like trying the brain regarding the stomach as part of its environment. <laughs> so, you see, in order to change the external thing, first must change. Within, within ourselves. If we want, I think something like this, you see, if you want, you see, a beautiful garden, first, any human, any human mind, you see, make, let's say, some kind of, you see, blueprint or the imagination or vision. And then, according to that idea, then you see, implement. Then the external things will, will, how to say, will, will materialize. So first must come uh, in, in mind. So then, like that. So that's what we believe. Uh, about, I put two meters, I think. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're all. All right, thank come you very much. Well, it wasn't like this at the last supper. Right, ladies and gentlemen, please, can, will you all see, take your seats? Uh, the whole planet is changing in all its parts, including Western Europe, the United States, Japan, Tibet, India, the whole th so-called third world. And it's not just a small change, it is a radical change, and it is a normal process. You cannot avoid the question whether the kind of society which exists now is coming to an end. Not only socialism, communism, whatever you call it, but also the Western type of society. No existing society is not only perfect at any given time, but it is, but the question is whether it is adequate. There's a lot of groping for power, fighting for power, a lot of cynicism. Now, when I'm thinking of thinking about our leaders, I think, why not bring in more intellectuals, scientists, spiritual leaders? Um, I think that we should put in charge more people who, uh, who are able to look far ahead, who are creative. I don't think it is so dangerous that these people are not professional politicians. I think it's quite good. And chances are that at least most of these people will be decent, particularly people of art, and I'm looking at Rauschenberg. Uh, these people, they come to understand quicker than others something that will happen in the future. They even don't, may not know this, you know, but by what, what Rauschenberg was doing, you know, just spilling water and, you know, paintings. This is some sign of the future. He feels things that will be coming. He is the magician. He is the modern magician that shows these things. Now we're waiting and the other colors set up. How long does it take? There? Well, it, it uh... You never know what they're going to do. No. So, it's like the erosion that I was talking about before. 
and I'm using that in my paintings now. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the problem. When I started working on the brass, I thought that uh, uh, I might be accused of knowing more about what I was doing than I do. And so I've kept it very loose. That I'm anxious to find out what it could become. Yeah, more than than what than, than, than what I would like for it to be. So you're following the process. I'm following the process, and the process is following me. me. Yeah. I mean, there's no separation. I mean, we are both bewildering each other. I'm giving them a kind of uh, life. Life. that they never had before. Yeah. And so I'm recycling, you know, yeah, the waste. Yeah. Whether I'm walking around the streets in New York City or Amsterdam. Actually, I did some nice works in Amsterdam, but it was, uh, uh, at the, the city is so clean. It was difficult to find anything that was considered a waste come back it's it's, it's no, there's it's erosion a there's erosion there too <laughs> all right i'll be there i'll be there tomorrow <laughs> okay <laughs> the root of the word compassion is say to feel together and uh, if people feel have the same feeling together and are responsible for each other then you have compassion and you don't think it's part of what's the word original sin that human beings in their very nature compete? Well, I don't think that there is such thing as original sin, and uh, uh, I think it has developed more and more with the growth of our society that there's no evidence that people in the hunter-gatherer society were all that competitive, but the, the more you made society big and you had organization and you had to get to the top, mm -hmm. the people on the bottom would suffer. There was a drive to compete, naturally. And do you think that perhaps the desire to compete is a weakness? Not a weakness, that's, that's a mistake. Right. <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest dangers. Uh, uh, that, like, like, I think that's what drives uh, countries and nations apart, is, is uh, a sense of competition. But are you competing, as it were, with yourself? Is that what the artist does? The satisfaction in the end is you reach what you were after. No, my, my problem is how successfully can I change my mind again? Mm. I always used to feel the compassion, not just a mere sort of, you see, the warm heart, but also, you see, I think genuine compassion is something, there is, is a sense of responsibility. That's why you see, I always is trying to, to share uh, my own experience. Whether they accept or not, it is something, uh, uh, and that's something different matter. But I, I, I do feel if I, uh, some people, if I explain something according to my own experience, that at least some people might get some new idea. And also, you see, regarding the relation between China and Tibet, so long, you see, fear, the atmosphere of fear remained there and distrust atmosphere there. Very difficult, impossible to develop mutual understanding, mutual respect, mutual trust. Um, the time has come, you see, their side must show the genuine conciliatory attitude. Now the best thing, you see, first reduce their military forces and eventually create zone of peace. Then this is the best way, concrete or how to say, the convincing attitude towards Tibetan, we trust you. You see, here in India, you see, the several occasions, you see, I'm telling you, the people, now we should have the democratic, how to say, government, uh, while I'm alive. You see, that practice must implement, must materialize. 
So, I really just want to be a just simple Buddhist monk. Anyway, it's a selfish motivation. Then I got genuine freedom. I don't want to have this kind of different title. That is in my heart as a service, always available. Among Tibetan, in any human community, if I can do something, I always available. So long is my last breathing. I I'm ready, wherever I can serve, including Chinese. As a human brother, sisters, then is the official title as a temple leader of Tibet or government head of the government, or the even if it's the leader of spiritual, that kind of is a title. I I feel sometimes that also is a, another is a mm, hindrance for have uh, a closer relation with different people. Is it not a problem that war is not only an accepted part of human behavior and human history, but perhaps even an acceptable part, that going to war is one of the things that excites and delights human beings? I think that people are be, would be ready to change now. I think the situation is changing. And, but there's still a residue of all this, uh, the old the feelings, and at the same time a tremendous incompetence in many ways. Like, I would like to add that I think we should forgive the debts of the third world because they're making the situation impossible there. I mean, it's a very elementary point. <laughs> uh, and, and they would probably be able to take care of themselves if they didn't have to pay back all that interest. But we have got to change our way of thinking, you see, that over many thousands of years, we have been, had a fragmentary way of thinking of breaking everything up into nations and religions and families and people as if they were independent when they are not. You see, it's a, it's a false, uh, incoherent way of thinking. We see reality according to our thought. And therefore, thought is constantly participating both in sh sh giving shape and form and figuration to ourselves and to the whole of reality. Right? Hmm. Now, but thought doesn't know this. Thought is thinking that it isn't doing anything. And I think this is really where the difficulty is, that we have got to see that thought is part of this reality. Huh? So the first thing we have to do for, in the long run is to look at our whole way of thinking, which has developed over so many thousands of years. I don't think it was the original way of thinking of the human race at all, but for many c complex reasons it came about. Now. Uh, that means that people have to make a, uh, uh, they have to participate to make a cooperative effort to have a dialogue, mm -hmm. a real dialogue in which we will <clears throat> not merely exchange opinions, but actually listen deeply to the views of other people without resistance. And we cannot do this if we hold to our own opinion and resist the other. As it, it doesn't mean we should accept the other, but we have to be able to look at all the opinions as suspended, as it were, in front of us, without carrying them out, without suppressing them. The and excitement has always been, you know, for for uh, uh, the separation and and checking out uh, the, the the differences, and that's why you said uh, that uh, competition thing. And uh, I think that there is a new conscience. Of, of, of realizing that that uh, this world has has uh, has its own limitations. I mean, this is not heaven. I mean, it's not hell either. But you know, this is not heaven, and this is the only place that we can be on. Yes. Well, that people are beginning to realize that if we don't begin to do this, we won't have anything. I mean, we can destroy the whole thing within a hundred years or so. Yes, but this wholeness, this new consciousness, this wholeness, is that something that you can only glimpse? Um, perhaps in, like, as you might have a glimpse of heaven, or is it something scientific? I mean, can, no, you, can you think your way through it? Not really completely. A wholeness is an attitude or an approach, but it can be given a scientific uh, uh, realization, you see. 
because of relativity and quantum theory, we can, if we wish, look on the world as a whole. See, I began uh, more or less uh, accepting the ideas of Niels Bohr. I wrote a book called Quantum Theory based on that. And, uh, I was feeling that, that the question really was, what is, uh, what is the nature of reality? You see, Bohr's view is an, based on an epistemology of saying that all we can discuss is our knowledge of reality. Yeah. And, uh, the, um, and I felt dissatisfied with that finally. Well, because it did not give any clear concept of reality. You see, mm -hmm. it, it only discussed what could be observed and measured. Now, if you said, okay, that that's all it is, then we'd say, uh, we will accept it on that basis, but then we would raise the question, what can we say? Well, reality would mean something that would have some existence independently of being known. You see, to say it might be that we would know it, but it did not require that we know it yeah. <laughs> in order to exist. Yeah. Now, it was difficult to see how this could be sustained, finally, in Bohr's view. Now. I tried to get some idea of what might be the process which was implied by the mathematics of the quantum theory. And this process is what I call enfoldment, that the mathematics itself suggests a movement in which everything, in which any particular element of space may have a field which unfolds into the whole, and, and, and the whole folds and enfolds into it. So you have this movement, and uh, I call this the implicate or enfolded order which unfolds into the explicate order where everything is separate. Now, the implicate order, everything is internally related to everything. Everything contains everything, right? So everybody has a, many experiences of this implicate order. The most obvious one is ordinary consciousness, where consciousness enfolds everything that you know or see, right? And, and now, it doesn't merely enfold the universe, but also you act according to that content. So, therefore, you're you are internally related to the whole, in the sense you act according to your consciousness of the whole. So you're not acting me mechanistically in the sense of being pushed and pulled by objects in the surroundings, <laughs> but rather according to your consciousness of them you act. Yeah. So if you're not conscious of them, you cannot act intelligently toward them. But the, uh, uh, so the consciousness is really our most immediate uh, experience of, of this implicate order. And you might think of nets of consciousness that are finer and finer, or we might think of capturing finer and finer aspects of the implicate order. Right? I think there's an, an intelligence that's, uh, Im that's Im implicit there, you see, to say uh, that uh, a kind of intelligence <laughs> unfolds. Right? The source of intelligence is not necessarily in the brain, you see, uh, the ultimate source, all the, but uh, much more uh, enfolded into the whole. Right? Now. Uh, the question, what do you want to call it, God, that depends on what you mean by the word, you see, because uh, uh, taking it as a personal God might restrict it in some way. I think science has begun to replace religion as the major source of, of the world view. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, therefore, if science takes a fragmentary world view, it will have a profound effect on consciousness. But science is always seen as measurement. Is that no longer true? Well, science is whatever people make of it. You see, science has changed over the ages, and it's different now from a few hundred years ago, and it could be different again. Now, there's no intrinsic reason why science must necessarily be measurement. This is a, another historical development which has come about over the past few centuries. It's entirely contingent and not absolutely necessary. And when Einstein produced his special theory, yeah. which the Times newspaper of London dismissed yeah. as being nonsense, um, was he moving towards wholeness? Yes, he definitely was. Uh, as, uh, he moved eventually toward a view of field theory where everything was one field, all the fields merging. So it was a step toward wholeness, although not, you know, it was a limited step, but still it was the beginning. And if we get to wholeness, are we then in heaven? I mean, where else is there to go? We'll never get there, you see. <laughs> it's not a place you can get. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, wholeness, I say, is a kind of attitude or a, uh, an approach uh, to the whole of life. Uh, it's, it's a way, if we can have a coherent approach to reality, then reality will respond coherently to us. <laughs> but nature has been tremendously affected by our way of thinking on the earth. Uh, Nature is now being destroyed. There's very little in, left on the earth which wasn't affected by how we were thinking.
And if we have coherence, in what way will our behavior be seen to be different? Well, we won't be, we will produce the results we intend rather than the results we don't intend. Yes. That's the first big change. Um, then we will be more orderly, harmonious, you know, we will be happier. I think we could put all that in there. But, but the first, the major source of unhappiness is that we are incoherent and therefore producing results that we don't really want. And then trying to overcome them or we keep on producing them. The question is, what is the real origin of consciousness? Yeah. Ah, that's exactly the case. Where did it come from? Was there a time when there was no consciousness? Well, I don't think it originates in time. You see, as I think it's a potential of the whole universe. Uh, wholeness will arise between us all in participation rather than in, in separately. But if you went as a hermit into a cave... Well, you still have nature. That's true. We, we are internally related to everything, yes. not externally related. Consciousness is an internal relationship to the whole. We take in the whole and we act toward the whole. And yeah. that internal, whatever we have taken in, determines basically what we are. Uh, I read somewhere that the hunter-gatherers would get all their food in about 15 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Now, the, <laughs> and we have not yet approached anything like that. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, the, leaving that aside, I think we need, we need to set aside some time for this. We need a period of emptiness and quiet where we can go into this. It doesn't mean that we should do nothing else. Is the creative artist, in fact, finding a way to this whole thing and to the truth without having to study the physics or the economics or anything else? Is he in his very act of creating, being, finding the truth? Are you? This search for uh, uh, the, the, the nirvana or something is making me sick. <laughs> you don't want it. <laughs> You don't want to vibe. I, I, you don't want to go I, to heaven. I, 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 I love, I, I love and, and breathe it, and uh, nobody could pay me more to stop working, and nobody could pay me more to make me work harder. But if you so, I don't know what the what that is about. Good. It comes natural. I mean, if you're an artist, I mean, he's an artist. I'm an artist, and you know, and there are many other artists here, you know, that. Uh, um, it's, it's a special moment that only happens when you allow it. And, 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 and you can't stop it. Apparently and nature endows people with, a special, with certain people with special creative uh, functions or ability. And uh, it is the same in, in spirituality. What do you think? Is this like in the genes or something? No, I mean, it concentrates. Look, it concentrates. It's like, you know, you have a prophet. Why is Jesus Christ a prophet? Because... Uh, we don't need Jesus everything, today. Just we got minute. his holiness here. <laughs> <laughs> nature, nature or consciousness or whatever, uh, at this moment is concentrated in somebody. It's concentrated in you. It's concentrated in Baum. It, in uh, some particular way, so you don't have to think about this being equally spread around. You know, so. That is not necessary, you know. I don't think that everybody has to be creative to be happy, at least at, as far as I can what see. What do they have to, to, to be happy? Well, they, uh, many people are just happy by existing uh, without uh, being poor and so on. Uh, you know, I walk out in the streets and I suddenly realize that nobody really cares what I write or think because most people care about other things, you know. 99% of their life consists in uh, being happy about uh, very simple things. And they don't have to read my books or uh, see your pictures or uh, uh, read uh, Bohm to or listen to the Dalai Lama to be happy. They know what that is, you see. They're endowed with it. But there are certain... Uh, personalities through which nature moves ahead. It has, it always has been that way, otherwise, you know, you just can't uh, uh, develop. I think actually, you see, these things are very, very difficult to make, you see, uh, uh, generalization. generalization. Mm -hmm. There are so many, you see, different people, variety. So you see, some people, 
I think by birth, see, very easy to learn something mm -hmm. and very creative nature, some not. And some cases, without much study, you see, the person becomes something very creative, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. Some people, so, and this is, I have no need to, to explain, is that? I think reality, of course, it's this whole this interdependent. You see, without, you see, in order to exist something, one thing, one particular thing, you see, without other factor, it cannot exist. So, you see, everything related. Uh, so, in reality and wholeness. Now, another question, whether individually can realize that or not, and whether individual really necessary to achieve some higher, how to say, I think, higher state of consciousness and happier to know the, that reality or not. Again, it depends on individual people. Uh, if, you see, in order to achieve something, in order to achieve progress, if we have to know reality, whole thing, impossible. Nobody can, because nobody can know the, the whole, the totality. the totality. That's impossible. Of course, uh, Buddhists, you see, we believe that when, when you get I'll say, enlightenment, then suppose we know everything. But that's something different, different, different question, isn't it? But if you can't grasp, if you can't understand the totality, can you only understand a bit of it? I thought you felt that we could, somehow or other, you could grasp the totality. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, no, I, uh, uh, no, I, <laughs> I know said, I'm putting words in your mouth. I don't. didn't say we can grasp the totality. We can have a feeling for the whole, and we can have the attitude of uh, not being restricted, not restricting ourselves to parts, but, uh, uh, but uh, allowing our consciousness to be based on the whole of whatever we can experience mm -hmm. and turn toward the whole of reality as far as we can and go from there to the parts. You see, saying the parts are seen within the whole rather than begin with the parts and put them together like a machine, you see. So that is really what I meant to say. When you understand totality, you become a totalitarian. Yeah. Yes. Because you are, also, you also are, you you are unique rise. then. You are unique then. No, you no, are no, the only no, 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 that's the opposite. Right. Like isn't it? When you talk about grasping something, uh, I think you're touching something that is going to vaporize and disappear yeah. and, and, and lose all of its spirituality. So and what can, what experience then can you have? You can have this, you can have this. And that's all. No, there's uh, everything that you can grasp with, without destroying it. But the important things you actually can't touch. But you know they are there? How else? So how do you know? By faith. <laughs> you believe in it. Ah, but you can... It is there. But belief can be something like faith. No, which is belief, be belief, belief is like grasping. Belief in something... If you have to believe something to believe it, well, then, then you already are making a deal. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, but if you, if, if, if you know something is there without being able to touch it, then it's, it's much more valuable. But there must be evidence. No, no. there doesn't have no. to be evidence. Would no. you want a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. no, see, uh, I, think, uh, I think that you have to be sensitive to, uh, uh, to ju just the question of delusion. That is, if, is there incoherence? You have to be sensitive to incoherence. Now, delusion arises when we are not sensitive to incoherence, when we overlook it. There's no guarantee that we can succeed in anything. Uh, if anybody claims to have evidence, it's always limited, and you can't uh, trust it either. So. In this game, there's no guarantee at all. As we can't trust anybody to tell us what's uh, about these things. I think that, that we're going in entirely the wrong direction, looking for coherence. I think that the world was not designed to make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> and I think it's been very good at it. It has to be diverse and it has to be anarchic. And original. Orig that's and what original to each person. Yeah. We have a tremendous resistance to acknowledging incoherence. Uh, people are constantly saying everything is all right. There's nothing to worry about. You know, it's a, 
uh, this is all very coherent. Uh, totalitarian regimes are constantly doing that, saying everything is wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, th th that's the key point, to attend to incoherence, uh, be, first acknowledge it and then begin to do something about it. It has to go in waves, I must say. It has to go in waves, you know. There's a time... Everything is in waves, he says. No, I said there's a time for anarchy and there's a time for order. Uh, order creates anarchy and anarchy creates order. And, uh, are we, and it goes in waves. waves create erosion. I think that the incoherence has become more dangerous because of the scale of, the, of our society and because of technology that we have all sorts of dangers such as nuclear war, biological war, chemical war, destruction of nature, and probably we can think of four or five others which are brought about by our power. You see now, the greater power we have, the greater we need coherence. Uh, the question, to my mind, is, is the human being capable of dealing with this situation, which he himself has produced? I think we all, you see, have, I think this has come from a uh, human being. You see, whether a scientist, or whether, you see, uh, the economist or artist, where we're born, we are the same, same human being. Uh, and I think it's the same desire. You see, same, I think, inner feeling. Then, you see, uh, follow it's a different profession way. And then sometimes, uh, you see, that's a fragmentation, sorry. Fragmentation. Oh. Now, you see, sometimes people call specialist. So when you see, you become specialist, then your how to outlook, something become very small. So, you see, that time, I think there is danger, you see, to forget about the Sorry. Wholeness. The things are, everything is related. So if something wrong here, it affects there. So everything, you see, they, I think, are pursued by desire of happiness. So that's the basic human nature. Now, when we return on that level, we can solve this problem. This is how I feel. So this is how I usually call spiritual. Not necessarily something is a dog, sorry, dogmatism. Without, you see, without accept or belief, you see, these I mean complicated thing. Just to simply be a good-hearted person. And I was thinking when you talked about the wholeness, I was thinking about the necessity of a new world order. We need a new world order, and the world order is not uh, one country uh, being a policeman, uh, but the world. The world order is and hopefully as a result of this, uh, the end of a false competition between communism and the other kinds of society. We can have a world order in which we all together, we and America and Europe and Japan and Tibet and uh, China and, uh, and, all all, the and all the other countries and all the animals. It is they who provide us with life, isn't it true? Yes. Well, no, no plants, there wouldn't be any life. We have to think about these things uh, in really, in, uh, in the spirit of wholeness and also in the spirit of His Holiness. In patriarchal societies, uh, people frequently talk about human nature when they really mean male human nature. That's a very frequent confusion. And I think uh, this discussion this morning about competition is a good example of a question that we cannot expect it to be solved by an all-male panel. If you, give up, if you give up the idea of competition, then there, there is no difference. Absolutely. You mean to imply that there's no competition between women? The is, idea is there, this. I put the question to you, is there a difference between the matriarchal and the patriarchal society? Uh, Only in Italy. Well, the, uh, the question is more subtle. It's, the whole subject is much Sorry, more can't, subtle than yeah. that. Can't hear you. Of course it's subtle. And it would take some time and it would take, you know, half the panel being women to really go into it. Well, here's but there's no hope we can uh, solve right. it in this context. Yeah. Okay. We're running into a... Lawrence Greener. We're running into a major difficulty here. My distinguished colleagues on the panel uh, and most of the audience have taken for granted from the beginning and the inception of this symposium that there is already an agreed upon idea of what is harmony. Yeah. This agreed upon idea of what everybody is accepting for being polite, being conventional and so on and so forth has inherently within its structure 
a problem about the relationships of male, biological males and biological females. And until we start to question essentially what the results of the life's work of David Bohm is, what the results of the life's work of all of our distinguished panelists are, which is that there is at any given time four or five simultaneous realities that are not hierarchical but are dangerous to some members of the society, we're not going to get anywhere. But if, if culture, to use your definition, if culture is shared meaning, mm. hasn't that sharing to be universal? It has to be. I mean, evidently we have a split which has developed over thousands of years and uh, uh, we're not understanding each other now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, as to what is meant by order and harmony, so we're, uh, we, have, we can't proceed very far. That, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't assume that you want total uh, destruction or uh, disharmony, you know, everything going to pieces. Now, you know, I see the importance of coherence, that if we produce results that we don't intend in a consistent way, uh, constantly, then I see that I don't want to go on with that. You see, that, that seems wrong. Now, do you agree on that point? So wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, so I say then that we, uh, uh, I say we need coherence, not perfect coherence, but to move toward coherence. Right? But can that coherence be developed in some way other than the means of balance that we've been forced into within contemporary society? Well, uh, by all means. That's let, the problem. By all means, let's try. You there, can't there is no way that, 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 that we can all speak Chinese or Russian, and uh, you know, and be able to address each other. But I think that that is the direction that that everything should go in, and uh, maybe through some of his holinesses, holiness, you know, that 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 we would be able to feel these reactions, and language would not be uh, a difficulty. But life is, life is not problems. Mm. Anyway, problems have solutions. That's easy. That's where politicians get into terrible troubles and they talk about the final solution and then we all pay a price. Life is about difficulties which you try to overcome. No, it isn't. Yeah. 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 No, no, I mean that... I, was, I thought it was all part of... You see, this is not... You speak a lot about this again is the same acceptance of a worldview. You're speaking in terms of if somebody questions the use of something and they are a member of society, they're complaining. They're not complaining, they're just questioning the use of something. Yeah. And we're not talking about solutions, and we're almost trying to find how to use what you have here, which is a resource of people who have accomplished something with the if short span of life If you can describe a problem, Lawrence, if yeah. you can describe a problem, you have one. <laughs> yes, that's quite true. You know, and I, I, think, I think that we should stop thinking about the world as a series of problems. Now, if we say we're, we've got a practical problem, this is going to limit us, saying, because there's an assumption behind every practical problem, right? And we're, that may stop us. So, see, suppose we say we want to communicate, but we are not going to set up a problem. A long, long time ago, I read about an anthropologist who studied some North American Indians at a rather primitive stage, hunter-gatherers, and he said what they did is, time to time, they got around in a circle, everybody, and they just talked and talked, talked all equals, and they made no decisions, they didn't, you know, they, uh, uh, or anything, they just stopped, and then everybody seemed to know what to do, right? <laughs> you see, the, it's clear what happened, that they, uh, by doing this constantly, they understood each other. The faster, the quicker, the, the, the people in the developed countries are, are, are taught to, uh, to understand that it is really in their interest to reduce poverty in the world. The faster our planet uh, will be able to solve that issue. And if it is delayed, this may become out of control and the planet will not be able to survive, not because of nuclear weapons, it will not be able to survive because, because of other things. There has to be a diversity of societies which are all of them striving towards this goal. I had had this idea about Rocky International, which is the Rauschenberg Overseas Cultural Interchange, which is devoted to peace and communication with video, with photographs, with art, and, 
and 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 one to one contact. I mean, we were in Russia, and uh, fifteen to twenty thousand people queued up a day. We were in in uh, Tibet, an extraordinary event, something that they had never seen. It was the first exhibition in Tibet. In China, we had the entire National Museum, artist communication, and uh, uh, when you confront uh, head on with uh, uh, people who uh, have different languages, uh, the uh, uh, the video the photographs and uh, the images within the paintings in response to their various cultures. And then you pass that on to another country. I mean, you can't really dislike somebody who, who you haven't seen but you agree with or understand. Rocky goes to um, countries that are, are um, basically sensitive areas. Uh, I feel that creativity is essential not only for science but for the whole of life. You see that, that uh, if you get stuck in a mechanical repetitious uh, order, then it will degenerate. <laughs> I think that's one of the problems that every civilization has got stuck in a certain repetition. And the, the creative energy has gradually died away, you see, and that's why the civilization died. You see, many civilizations vanish not only because of external pressure, but also because internally they decayed. Up to now, usually I call the mother planet. Does it mean without say, tolerance? To now, you see, the mother planet is facing, let's say, the limitation. So therefore, you see, showing us the, uh, some kind of, you see, warning. So therefore, now we, I think the, the reality, the situation, the reality itself, now telling us human being or humanity must work together with sort of, you see, common, common ground or how to say, common aim with sense of responsibility.